Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and I was cruising around the internet earlier this year when I happened upon a journal article by Professor Joel Cohen. It's entitled, Mathematics is Biology's Next Microscope, Only Better. It's a fascinating article. I'll include a link in the video description down below. I reached out to Professor Cohen and asked him if I could put together this video to summarize the major points. He thought that was great. Thanks for being a teacher, he said. And he included a picture of himself. And so what does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. I was recently listening to a mathematician at Montana State University. He works with biologists to do mathematical modeling, and he's had over 60 peer-reviewed articles, so he really knows what he's talking about. And in this research, they were looking at E. coli. E. coli takes about 20 minutes to reproduce, but what they were wondering is, you know, why doesn't reproduce every one minute or every five minutes? And what they found is that the limiting factor was the ribosomes. The ribosomes have to drive along the RNA and they make the proteins because the proteins are going to make the bacteria. But they go one after another. It's not just one ribosome. That would take years. But they're going to go one after another after another. And what ends up happening is that they get traffic. It's almost like all the cars driving on a row. As one slows down, the one behind it slows down, it slows down the whole thing. And so what he had done is created a mathematical model using high-level mathematics to explain, like, what's the limit? How fast can they actually go? And he was excited because he got the wrong answer. He got around 60 minutes instead of 20 minutes. And what that told him is that there had to be some other mechanism, something that the bacteria were using to communicate so they wouldn't have these big traffic jams. And so what really mathematics is doing is opening up these new fields in biology. But let's first talk about the first microscopes. And the first microscopes open up a whole new world of biology. And so imagine looking at a leaf under the first microscope and all of a sudden you don't see a flat piece of green, you actually see cells popping out. And you can see organelles, in this case you can see the chloroplasts inside those cells. It opens up new realms and the whole idea of cell theory wouldn't have been built until we eventually had the microscopes. Or let's say you were the first biologist looking at pond water and no one had ever seen this life, like an amoeba or these little algae. Um, it must have opened up a brand new world and just to look at that it must have been feeling like you were exploring space for the first time. And even Charles Darwin, one of the most famous biologists, said that mathematics seems to endow one with something like a new sense. And so mathematics acts like a microscope. It opens up new worlds that we haven't seen before. And mathematics has been associated with other sciences in the past. And so the word geometry comes from earth measure. And so they were first figuring out how we can quantify and measure the earth, but they had to build a mathematics to explain that. Or the calculus didn't really show up until Newton and Leibniz actually had a reason to do that. And for me, I didn't really get calculus until I took physics and understand that calculating the area under curve is really important. But what's interesting interesting is that biology is like physics, but better. <laughs> in other words, it's way more complex than physics is. And to give you an example of that, just think of our planet. So our planet is going to have simple atoms that organize into molecules. And if we were to just talk about the inorganic things on our planet, so minerals and rocks, it's fairly simple. But start thinking about the complexity of life and you understand how complex it is and it's not really understood and it's not clearly understood with the mathematics that we have today. And we even see that through history. And so one of the big turning points in biology is we had this understanding of natural selection that was put forward by Darwin. We had this understanding of genetics that was put forward by Mendel. They lived at the same time, but nobody, nobody really put their two ideas together until a couple of mathematicians came up with the Hardy-Weinberg equation and showed how genes were the units that were being selected in a population. And as we go forward, let's get to some more complex mathematics. This is the radon transform. This is an Austrian mathematician who was just doing math to start with. What he was looking at is imagine a line that's moving through material. And the material is not uh, homogeneous. It's going to have different densities. And as a result, it's going to bend the object as it moves fo forward through it. And so we could think of that as like an x-ray. Imagine we're making x-rays and we have a source on this side and we have a sensor on this side. And then we put some kind of an object in the middle. Well, as we rotate that object in the middle, that 
the uh, x-rays that are moving through it are going to be refracted and they're going to be bent. And so what we get is something called a sinogram. And so what uh, Redon said is let's tie start with the, the uh, sinogram itself. Let's start with this pattern. Could we work backwards and figure out what that shape inside that uh, sensor is actually going to be? And so the mathematics gets incredibly complex. These are things that I have no idea what this means. Um, Euclidean space, Huff space, large vectors, and so basically what we can find is if we work backwards through all of this, we can figure out what that structure is. Mathematics reveals this to us. Um, but he wasn't really looking at an application, but we have a huge application of this. If we put an object in the middle, shoot x-rays through it, and then rotate that, we can figure out what it is using mathematics. And that's how a CT scan works. You are in the middle of x-rays, and as those go through you, it's exposing things that we couldn't see. And so you can see how this is like a new microscope. It's allowing us to see things that we've never seen before. And so there's huge implications here. Um, and what we're getting now is an explosion of this new field called mathematical biology. Where is it coming from? Well, we have all of this data, genomic data, data that's locked in the DNA that's being unlocked. We have Moore's Law where we're getting faster computers that get cheaper. Um, we have fractals. This right here is a rule of 30. It was developed by the person who's, uh, who started Wolfram Alpha. And basically what you get is patterns that are predicting what life looks like. This cone snail actually has a fractal growing on its shell. Or we're having now in silico experiments. What's that? Experiments that we can do in a computer rather than doing experiments in the lab or experiments using living material. And so let me throw up this quote from Dr. Co Dr. Cohen. The calculus of Newton and Leibniz in probability theory is a line between ancient thought and modern thought. With Without an understanding of the concepts of analysis, especially the concept of a limit, it's not possible to grasp much of modern science, technology, or economic theory. Those who understand the calculus, ordinary or partial differential equations, and probability theory have a way of seeing and understanding the world, including the biological world, that's unavailable to those that, that do not. And so what he's saying there is that if you really want to be a biologist, it's not an excuse now to say that I don't understand the mathematics. And when I looked at this quote, I saw that the limit ends up being the limit between really understanding uh, biology and not understanding it. And so I wanted to understand, like, what's the importance of a limit? I mean, and, and I wanted to consult somebody who really knew what they were talking about. And if you're talking about the internet and you're talking about mathematics, um, there's really only one person who knows that, and that's going to be Patrick JMT. And so what I've done is I've written my question, why are limits important in mathematics and calculus? And what I'm going to do is put this in a manila envelope. I don't know if this will work for you, but it works for me. Put it in an envelope. I'm going to put my return address here, Bozeman Biology, and I'm going to send this to Patrick JMT. And I'm going to see what he can do, if he can come up with a good answer to why limits are important and, and what do they do. Okay, so I recently got this package from Paul Anderson of Bozeman Biology, Bozeman Science. Uh, teacher extraordinaire, and he asked me two, two simple questions that uh, you could spend a lot of time on and gave me the her Herculean task of doing it in, in about five minutes or less. So... He asked, what are limits and why are they important? And I wish we had 10 hours because I think that's what it would take to do it justice. But let me give kind of a quick intuitive idea. So uh, so let's start off by saying, what is a limit? So intuitively, let's start with a sequence of numbers. Say 1, 1 1.5, 1 1.9, 1 1.99, etc. It looks like those numbers are getting closer and closer to the number 2. So if these numbers get arbitrarily close to one single number in this case, the number 2, we say that number is the limit. So take a sequence of numbers, do they get close to some number? If so, we say yes, that's the limit. That, that's, to me, intuitively a, a limit. Now, um, why do mathematicians like limits? Well, they give us a way to make a lot of intuitive, and I should say non-intuitive ideas, much more formal. Mathematicians need this 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 formal th these technical definitions it gives us something to to test our theories and our ideas against okay so that's the basic idea now so i kind of gave you the hand wavy definition if a mathematician said what's the limit of the number there is the technical definition it's actually interesting because it took historically a couple hundred years after calculus was developed for people to agree upon this technical definition of a limit and it's been giving calculus students nightmares ever since. So 
Uh, Newton and Leibniz actually used what were called infinitesimals, and there was some philosophical objection to that, although it's now been shown that they... Uh, there, there, in fact, are no issues. You can use these, what are called, infinitesimals. But we actually use this definition. I believe it's typically attributed to Cauchy, is who came up with this. So, interesting. It actually took a couple hundred years to come up with that. Well, in calculus, where do we need, you know, where do we need these definitions, or where do we need these limits, I should say, to produce these definitions? Well, two huge places is to find the derivative of a function. That tells us about instantaneous rates of change, and also in definite integrals, that calculates the net change of a function. So just, again, two specific applications he here of limits. And these, finding the derivative and also being able to, to find a definite integral just has tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of applications. Just uh, it, The idea is that you can deal with sort of functions that are constantly changing. And that was an issue in mathematics. It was easy to, you know, to deal with sort of static situations. It was this, this problem where things keep changing that would provided a real, a real mechanical nightmare for mathematicians. How do you compute things when things are constantly changing? And calculus solved that problem. So there's the technical definition of a derivative of a function. Again, it involves a limit. Don't want to, well, I would, actually, I do want to. We don't have time to. And also to calculate, um, well, I should say to define a, a definite integral. Again, we use limits. And in this time, uh, we actually have a limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so the real magic was, it, it also, is how do you actually compute these things, right? You, you, you're letting something get arbitrarily large. How do you mechanically deal with that? And that was one of the magical things about calculus, was it, it got over that hurdle. Okay, so maybe something a little closer to home for those of you that haven't had calculus, there's these really neat things called Markov chains. And in this case, it's what's called a transition matrix. So this has to do with a little bit of genetics. So suppose we've got a, a plant species, and it has red, white, or pink flowers. And each one of those genotypes is going to be crossed with a red flowering plant to produce the next generation. We want to know what happens in the long run. So according to this transition matrix, it says if you start with a red plant, you cross it with a red plant, it says there's a 100% chance that the, the next generation will produce red plant, or will produce red flowers. Uh, no way that it's going to make pink or white flowers. If it starts pink, you cross it with a red flowering plant, it says there's a 50% chance the next generation will give red flowers, 50% chance it'll make pink flowers. If you start off with a white plant, cross it with a red plant, it says there's no way it gives you red flowers, but it does always give you pink flowers the next generation. Well, if we keep crossing these plants over and over and over, if we keep, you know, keep this process up where we keep uh, the next generation, we again cross it with a red flowering plant, we can ask ourselves what happens in the long run. And it turns out, you know, in the long run, suppose we call this our matrix T, it turns out in the long run to compute this, what we do is we start taking our matrix T and we multiply it by itself. We raise it to the power of n. And we can actually show that as n goes to infinity, what happens, so if you keep multiplying this matrix by itself, you'll get a new one. Again, multiply it by this one, you'll get a new one. Again, multiply it by this one, you'll get a new one. You can actually show that you produce the following matrix. So red, pink, white, red, pink, white. And what this tells us is, in the long run, it says actually all the plants will eventually be red flowering plants. So limits help you determine what happens in the long run. So, you know, certainly if you, if you are, uh, you could easily collect this data in the lab, right? You know, you've got some plants, you see what happens to the offspring, you collect this data. You obviously don't want to do this for 100 years. Um, and that's where mathematics comes in. It says, hey, you know, we can analyze what happens uh, using, using powers of the matrix and taking a limit, and then we don't have to wait a million years to see what happens. And yeah, okay, we're talking about pretty flowers, but certainly this is genetics. There's gobs of applications here. So, all right, I hope I give the, this is, does justice to, to, to limits. I know it's super quick. Again, you know, so I would say it's been instrumental in defining ideas and calculus, and also it gives us a way to deal with things mechanically when things get really large and also really small. 
Thanks, Patrick. That's amazing. I think mathematics offers us a new way to look at biology. It's going to open up new possibilities that we didn't understand before. And I think biology is going to stimulate new mathematics that didn't exist before. It's going to allow us to understand big concepts like the biosphere, molecules, macroevolution, photosynthesis, epidemiology, how, how disease flows through uh, humans, and could maybe even unlock the brain. But when I was listening to uh, Professor Gideon talk about the brain and talk about all these complexities, what he said was interesting to me. What he said was, let's imagine we want to take a brain and build a mathematical model of that. So how do you do that? Well, there's 100 billion neurons in the brain. We're going to have to create a, mi a model that has 100 billion parts. And when we've done that, we've now created something as complex as the thing that we hope to understand. So that didn't get us anywhere. And so I think we're just starting down this pathway into understanding how biology really works. Mathematics is going to allow us to look at that, but we're going to need people like you, bright students who understand biology and also understand mathematics. And so work hard, and I hope that was helpful.